A routine run on a quiet weekday morning would lead to a gruesome discovery and thrust investigators into one of Australia's most bizarre murders. We'd never found him at all except for a boot and a pair of sunglasses. It became evident that robbery wasn't the motive. You ask yourself, well, what then is the motive? And the only thing that was going to identify that person for us was his DNA. It appeared to be someone who knew what they were doing, possibly even someone with medical skill. And then of all things, he went to his mother's birthday party. And it was at that time that we thought that we had a psychopathic killer on our hands. When cab driver Eddie Barmad hadn't returned home following his night shift, his wife was immediately anxious. Eddie was a devoted husband and he never deviated from routine. Her fears were well founded. The cabbie's final hours remain a mystery. He was last heard from at about 10 o'clock last night, taking a fare to Peakhurst, but was murdered in this secluded street on Sydney's northern beaches. The scene was pretty much like any crime scene that you would go to, except the intensity of the attack on the victim was somewhat different to what you would see in other crime scenes, and uh, the injuries that he had sustained were, were quite substantial and horrific. Mr Barmard emigrated from Lebanon in 1974. He leaves a wife and seven children. I was waiting this morning till my dad comes home. Yesterday I got two awards coming first in maths and first in electronics. He wanted to see this. Well, now he's gone. The victim in this particular case had sustained numerous wounds to the arms and the hands area, which is indicative of him trying to defend himself. As police searched the surrounding area for the murder weapon, the first piece of hard evidence was found. The ignition key to the taxi was located in the gutter some 60 metres away from the murder scene. The key tag for those keys had a person's fingerprint imprinted in the victim's blood. The key tag was not the only potential lead. We had blood smearing uh, within the front passenger area of the, of the cab and also in the rear of the cab behind the driver's seat. Those signs indicated to us uh, that there were more than likely two people in the cab when this took place. Swabs of those smears were taken for testing. Detectives hoped that during Mr Barmad's desperate struggle, the killer or killers might have been injured. Traces of their blood might still remain in the cab. He never harm anybody, you know, all what he does believe, growing veggies. All what he doesn't, he doesn't have enemies. All people love him. On this particular occasion, the victim had a large wad of money in his top shirt pocket, and it became evident that robbery wasn't the motive. With the ferocity of the attack, you ask yourself, well, what then is the motive? It says to us as investigators, I really hate this person. You know, it's an anger type attack. And there's another component that comes into that, and on this occasion it, it was uh, a full moon. And I know even myself years ago I would poo-poo the, the theory, but you see so much evidence of it that uh, people do act strangely at these times. And so not wanting to be single-minded about it, that was one of the considerations that we had a deranged person running around out there. And the other aspect of that which was quite intriguing was the signs in the cab said we had two people. Do you then have two deranged people running around? And that was a major interest to us. A month later, another grisly murder. This time a torso had been discovered washed up on the shores of a secluded bay. The torso was found just a metre from the shore. It was first noticed on Tuesday. It was all wrapped up in bubble wrap and string bag and um, yeah, I didn't take much notice of it really. Just thought it looked odd. I went over and I photographed the torso in situ. I turned the body over and saw that there was a further package containing rocks which had been wired together on the back of the torso. Looking at the torso, it appeared quite clear that it was the torso of a, of a male in the prime of his life. He was solid, he was very, very tall. Um, thinking about that and thinking about people missing in the area that fitted that description, my mind went back to Stephen Dempsey, who disappeared some three and a half months earlier. 
but very, very much fitted that physical description. Say hi to Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Stephen Dempsey was a 34-year-old landscape gardener who hadn't been seen since leaving work on August the 2nd, 1994. Mr Dempsey, look at this sexy body. <laughs> His abandoned car was found at a well-known homosexual beat three days later by his business partner, Peter Rolfe. On my way home, uh, I was going down the Wakehurst Parkway and uh, as I just drove past the entrance to Deep Creek, I suddenly remembered that Stephen told me that he used to frequent the place there. So I drove in and there was his car parked there. I raced out of my car, looked at his car, and I saw the book he'd been reading the last time I saw him lying page down on the passenger seat and um, also his camera was lying there, and that suggested to me that perhaps he was still around the place. There was also a food container lying on the floor of the car. The label read, August 2nd, the last time friends or family had seen Stephen alive. The adrenaline was pumping, of course, when I, when I found his car, but at the same time, there was this terrible fear as to what on earth had happened because it was so totally unlike him OK, perhaps he didn't, there was some reason he wouldn't contact me, but the fact that he wouldn't contact his sister, who he lived with, to explain his disappearance for, for three days. I yelled out his name a few times and um, I was panicking, um, uh, in a state of shock, and um, that's when I thought, right, I've got to notify the police straight away. Police fear for the safety of a man missing from Sydney's northern beaches since Tuesday. Mr Dempsey was last seen here in Neutral Bay working as a landscaper, but late yesterday his car was found at Deep Creek Reserve near Narrabeen. It was locked up and intact. Uh, there was no visible signs of any foul play there. We would be seeking the assistance of people who frequent the reserve at Narrabeen. A lot of people would have been there and seen this motor vehicle over the last couple of days. Someone had. Deep Creek Reserve was also a dog training area. For three mornings in a row, one dog owner noticed Stephen Dempsey's car parked in the same spot. On one of those mornings, his dogs pulled a boot from the creek. We'd never found him at all except for a boot and a pair of sunglasses. Both items were identified by the family as belonging to Stephen Dempsey. What detectives were yet to know was that this murder, now seemingly unrelated, would be linked to that of the taxi driver. When a torso was found washed up on a shore, one of the first things was to establish its identity. Without that, there was little chance that detectives could figure out a motive or find the killer. The remains were taken to the morgue in hope that the forensic pathologist could find some answers. We often x-ray the decomposed body to see if we can find any signs of any projectiles, any sort of unusual findings, any fractures and so forth. So in this case, the body was x-rayed before we did anything else. And then when we x-rayed it, we saw an object in the middle of the chest, which looked like to me was a, a large scalpel blade. When we opened the chest and saw the blood and saw the arrow, we all said, oh my goodness. Detective Lynch already suspected that the torso was that of Stephen Dempsey and the discovery of the arrowhead in the heart narrowed the odds. Four months earlier, the detective had sent divers into this creek and what they found was now potentially a vital piece of evidence. A bow and arrow had been found in the vicinity at the bottom of Deep Creek a short time after Mr Dempsey disappeared. Now that bow had been very corroded when we first discovered it, which led everyone to believe it had been there for in fact a lot longer than it had. Attached to that was a quiver with about um, three arrows with broadheads, and the broadhead was identical to the one that was in the chest of the deceased. I was fairly sure then my hunch had done. Uh, Punch had something to it. I sort of said, well, that's fine, but this man's not, is too well preserved to be, to have been dead for as long as this person had been. He, he didn't appear to me to be dead for four months. Chris Lawrence was saying the body had been in the water for three weeks. So he had three months and a week 
to account for when where was where had Stephen Dempsey been during that time? Uh, that was the mystery. Well, I said, if it is him, then he's been somewhere else. They've put him somewhere in cold storage or, or, or done something with the body in the meantime. There seemed little doubt that the torso was that of Stephen Dempsey, but it needed to be confirmed. And in this particular case, all we have is a torso. And the only thing that was going to identify that person for us was his DNA. But in order to do that, you have to have both the mother and the father. In this case, we did. There was blood still in the chest cavity. And so we did have usable nuclear DNA from the torso and we were able to get a pretty quick result. DNA tests have solved a murder mystery which has baffled Sydney police for months. They've confirmed that a human torso found at Pitwater last month was the remains of a man missing since August. For the family of Stephen Dempsey, it's a tragic end to a four-month search. We know that uh, Mr Dempsey died as a result of a penetrating injury to the chest area. But that's virtually all police know and they're again appealing to the public for help. While the identity of the torso made headlines, the cause of death remained a secret. With any investigation, you are very, very mindful about the, the, the evidence that you've got, firstly, and the information that you do and do not release. And on this particular occasion, it occurred to us that the offender had overlooked the fact that he had left the arrowhead embedded in the, in the victim's heart. And that arrowhead was the sole piece of evidence at that time that we had which uh, you know, connected the, the deceased to the killer. But that arrowhead wasn't the only thing the killer had left behind. The forensic pathologist had also found possible clues to the killer's identity. I've seen a number of bodies that had been dismembered and this one had been done incredibly neatly. It appeared to be someone who knew what they were doing. Someone like a boner, somebody who worked in an abattoir, possibly even someone with medical skill. And when Detective Lynch took the bow from Deep Creek to an archery specialist, he got more leads on the killer. It had been built specifically to be very, very powerful, that bow. It had been put together to be powerful. And that was determined ultimately by what they call the draw weight, the amount of strength it takes to draw the string back. Well, this suggested that the person had it was fairly solid, it was fairly strong. Second of all, you could make a measurement between the bow handle and where the string's position was when it was fully strung. And that would give you the length between a person's wrist and their shoulder. And looking at that, it was worked out that the person that had a bow like that would have been about five foot nine inches tall, five foot ten inches tall. Then another piece was added to the puzzle. A young man reported an incident at Deep Creek in December 93, some eight months before Stephen Dempsey disappeared. It was dusk. He and his friend had been walking on the path one way and they saw someone walking the opposite way. As they walked past him, they saw he was carrying a compound bow. They've heard a noise, they've turned around to see this person with the compound bow cocked and pointing at them. One of them scattered into the bush, ran away. The other one went into the bush, picked up a big stick and confronted this guy. Now luckily, that person had been a member of the field archery club nearby and he had a very, very good knowledge of bows and arrowheads, etc., etc. He identified the bow as being a camouflaged compound bow, which was identical to the bow that we'd recovered in the water. He then described the arrowhead that he'd seen on that bow and which had been pointing at him and he'd seen it fairly clearly as being a Davies Aztec arrowhead. He then went on to give a fairly accurate description of the person that had propped him with the bow. He was uh, a male, he was five foot nine. <laughs> um, he was a fairly solid build. Um, he was uh, white Australian. Uh, he was wearing a motorcycle jacket, which was interesting. Um, and he was eight months prior to the murder, seen with the bow, with identical arrowheads, some hundred yards away from the murder scene. So was this person the killer of Stephen Dempsey? And what, if any, was his connection with the brutal murder of taxi driver Eddie Barman? Nearly four months after the investigation began into Stephen Dempsey's murder, the police hit a brick wall. With the detailed profile that we had, we knew a lot about the man. We didn't have his name. By releasing the cause of death with the arrowhead as being the cause, we were straight away narrowing down the field of people we would be possibly looking for. 
Police are hunting a Sydney Rambo who murdered a young gardener with an arrow through the heart. 32-year-old Mr Dempsey was targeted at Deep Creek Reserve Narrabeen, a notorious gay pickup beat. Police now fear the killer could be living out a sick fantasy, stalking bushwalkers on Sydney's northern beaches. Two others had previously been menaced the year before Mr Dempsey's murder. We're appealing to the public if they could come forward with any information, especially if they frequent the area down there, any information they have of seeing a man carrying a bow and arrow with quiver in the vicinity of the park from November 1993 through to about August 1994. We released information and almost straight away we started getting calls from members of the public. Good morning, Manival. Please, can I help you? I'm a member of a bushwalking group and I do recall being in Deep Creek Reserve about 18 months ago. We saw a young guy um, and he had a, a bow and an arrow and I remember he said, watch out, there are a couple of poofters down the track. He was hunting for fish with a bow and arrow. It was one of those fancy looking bows with the pulleys on either end. Is there any more information you can give us about this gentleman? Oh, I'd say he'd be in his early 20s. He's about, say, 5'9", 5'10". I was in the Deep Creek area on the northern beaches paddling a kayak and uh, something very strange up there happened. I th there was a guy up there and I thought at the time that he was just uh, fishing with a bow and arrow. Was there any warning prior to that? No, he didn't say anything. He continued to follow me. He was um, going through the bush at quite a rate of knots, so I was paddling as hard as I could, but he seemed intent on keeping up with me. So there was certainly a person around that had a, a fetish with bows and arrows and assaulting people with them, or certainly scaring them. He threatened two young guys. When was this? Out of the hundreds of calls police received, five mentioned one person, 22-year-old Richard Leonard. Who lived nearby. He was the same build, he was the same age group. He had a camouflaged compound bow in his house. Well, I certainly had one at this time. He rode a motorcycle. He'd worked in an abattoir, and from every person we'd spoken to, he displayed the idiosyncrasies that we thought we were looking for with our man. We were, we were cooking with gas, so to speak. It now seemed as though the police had found their killer. But when they entered Richard Leonard's name into their computer to check on any previous form or convictions, their investigation took a whole new turn. He presented at St Vincent's Hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning with his girlfriend, suffering from a, uh, a knife wound to the chest. Uh, it had actually punctured his lung, deflated his lung. He needed to have a drain put into his, uh, into his chest, into his lungs, and uh, it's, a, it's a very painful process, apparently, and uh, he uh, refused painkillers and wanted to revel in the experience, so we were told. And uh, again, you know, I mean, this all adds to the picture of the person we're looking at as being somewhat different to your normal and, and quite, quite strange. He said initially to the police that spoke to him at the hospital that he'd been attacked by a group of people in Hyde Park. Um, then he changed his story and in fact said that um, it had, the, the injury was a result of an S&M session he'd had with his girlfriend. Um, she too had some injuries to her hands at the time. But the police obviously hadn't believed him. They were a little bit perplexed about it. They couldn't take it any further with what they had. So they'd uh, just put the report on that they'd spoken to this person at uh, the St Vincent's Hospital. The date Richard Leonard was admitted to St Vincent's was the 18th of November, 1994, the same day as Eddie Barmad, the taxi driver, was found dead in his cab. When our crime scene team examined Mr Barmad's taxi at Colorado Plateau, an unusual looking smear was seen in the centre of the steering wheel. It actually was a different colour to surrounding blood smears and that's why it caught the eye of our examiner, Richard Layton, who took a swab of that blood for analysis. And it was found to be a mixture of uh, two persons' DNA, one being Mr Barmad, but that was only the minor component. The major component was from an unknown person. It appeared that the offender may have been cut and injured himself during the struggle. For us, it was we're starting to get pretty exciting by this stage because there we have two people, both wounded, both wounded on the night that the cab drivers murdered and two separate inquiries started to come together. And it was at that time that we thought that we had a psychopathic killer on our hands. 22-year-old Richard Leonard 
was a person of interest in the death of Stephen Dempsey, but that interest intensified when police discovered that he and his 19-year-old girlfriend had been injured on the same night that taxi driver Eddie Barmad was murdered. We commenced surveillance on him, kept tabs on him, what he was doing, and we went as far as we could to check the background information that uh, we'd received about him. And everyone that we spoke to that knew the man confirmed the behavioural patterns about him that we, we suspected he'd be, he'd be showing. He, he seemed like a disturbed man. As a result of that, we developed an investigative strategy which uh, required us to eventually confront them and to interview them. When we spoke to him in the house and introduced ourselves and conducted a search warrant there and told him that we suspected him for two murders, he was as cool as cool. We could have been door-to-door -door salesmen. Um, we could have been a friend calling over. There was no appreciable fear, no concern, no outrage. That sort of suggestion would be put to him. I remember he sat down when he agreed to come to us to Manly Police Station, I think very, very calmly laced about a 32 lace Doc Martin boot put both of them on, took all the time in the world. Very, 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 very cool. And do you agree that I told you that uh, we were making inquiries in relation to the death of a man by the name of Stephen Dempsey? Yes, that is correct. Do you agree you told me you did not wish to say anything in terms of that matter? Yes, that is correct. Do you agree in other conversations we've had, you told me that you once had a bow and arrow when you were living at a Celsius Street, Colorado photo. Yes, that is correct. Do you also agree you told me that the arrowheads you used were arrowheads called bodkins? Bodkin. Bodkins. Bodkin, they are a tin alloy head comprising of three um, blades. Right. Like a tripod. Okay, fine. Have you ever used broadheads? No. At all? It was a key statement. Leonard was denying that he ever used broadhead arrows. It was a broadhead that was found in Stephen Dempsey's heart, and it was a broadhead that the two young men had identified when they were threatened at Deep Creek Reserve. That obviously caused us to continue our inquiries, and as a result of previous information we'd received, we identified premises that he used to rent, and we canvassed the local neighbours who told us that he used to sit on the back porch and shoot arrows into a, an apple tree in the backyard. As a result of that, uh, we examined that tree, and lo and behold, we find uh, embedded underneath the bark, we stripped the bark off and embedded underneath the bark we find arrowheads identical to the type that we located from the, the deceased. Do you also agree that today you have provided us with our samples of your hair and a blood sample? Yes, that is correct. Our purpose behind that was obviously to compare it with the blood sample we'd found at the murder of Mr Barmett. Do I have to find my own way home or can I get a bit? The tour is now... Um, 3.18 p.m. One for this one final thing. Richard, do you agree with me? That jacket was at your house today? Yes, I did. Oh, that's your jacket? Yes. He went home. We were in a position to know he spoke to his girlfriend straight away. And he left the house never to return. We knew at that stage that we were on the right track, but there was no point in arresting this person and charging him without the evidence. And that evidence was Leonard's blood sample, sent for DNA analysis. The first test indicated to them that, yes, there was a likelihood that his blood sample specimen matched the one taken from the, the cab, but they had to go through further processes, and that would take a few more days. Uh, as you can imagine, we're extremely anxious at this stage. Uh, we're concerned that it will match, obviously, because if it doesn't match, we've, we've just hit a brick wall and we have to go back to, to, to scratch. The second test went positive. And then we reached the point where the night before the third test was due back, uh, Richard Leonard called us up, said that he was the Christian City Church at uh, Sydenham Road, Brookvale, and he wanted to speak to us, and he was with his uh, girlfriend. 
that Leonard had made admissions to the pastor about his involvement in these crimes and wanted to, uh, to give himself up to police. They were each clutching a Bible and he told me he'd um, shaved his head during the night as some cleansing process relative to, you know, confessing all sins. Police swooped on a church at Brookvale last night, arresting 19-year-old Denise Shipley and her 22-year-old boyfriend, Richard Leonard. On speaking to a pastor, um, he then made a phone call to the local authorities um, and from there a arresting officer came down to the church. Under heavy security, the couple was accused of killing cabbie Ezzedine Barmad. Leonard also charged with the murder of gardener Stephen Dempsey. But while Richard Leonard admitted to murdering the taxi driver, he claimed that he killed Stephen Dempsey in self-defence. I wanted him to be stopped. I didn't want him to come any closer to me. I felt threatened. It was now up to the detectives and forensic specialists to prove him wrong. All right. Do you agree, Mr Leonard, I spoke to you uh, this morning, uh, last night, I'm sorry, about the, uh, the death of Mr Dempsey? Yes. And do you agree you told me that uh, um, indeed you were uh, responsible for Mr Dempsey's death by firing an arrow into his chest? Yes, I believe I was responsible. Right. And do you agree in the interview last night you told me that uh, when you arrived you put your bow in a cave while you went further up the creek to see if there were any fish in the creek? Or yes. That's yeah, correct? That's right. Mr Leonard told us that um, whilst high on speed, He'd gone down to the deep creek with his compound bow, which he used to shoot fish in the creek. Uh, he'd left it in a cave, scattered along the creek to see if there were any mullet to shoot, came back and said he was then propositioned by Stephen Dempsey, who was in the cave and, and urinating at the time. You've gone into the cave there. You've seen Mr Dempsey urinating. He smiled at you. You've come outside. What did you do then? He stood over here and he said, you're going to the guy's deal. Uh, and, uh... And I said, no, I, I picked up my bow and I pointed at him and I, I, I said, don't, said, don't come over here, I'm going to shoot him. And he, he said, I don't believe you. And then he said, I'm going to walk towards you now. And, and he walked, he started coming towards me. Then at about 10 feet, I let go of, of the string and, and the arrow went, went into him. Was it your intention to kill Mr Dempsey when you fought the arrow at him? It wasn't my intention to kill anybody when I fired the arrow at him. I wanted him to be stopped. I didn't want him to come any closer to me. I felt threatened. But the detectives did not believe his version of events. They believed Richard Leonard deliberately and callously killed Stephen Dempsey. Everything we knew about a compound bow at that time suggested they were very, very powerful weapons and most of the people that had shot them were of the opinion that a compound bow fired in such a way would have virtually gone straight through a person. In the case of Mr Dempsey that hadn't happened. The arrow had lodged fairly firmly in his heart, maybe halfway through the body. And that didn't correspond with the range and the power of the bow that Mr Leonard had and, and, and the way he described that it occurred. In an attempt to rebut Leonard's version of events, the team decided to reenact the scene using a pig carcass. We obtained an identical bow, identical arrowheads, and we conducted a series of tests uh, from varying distances. Leonard had said he shot Mr Dempsey from 10 feet, or three metres away. At that distance, the arrow went straight through the carcass. The arrow that corresponded with the type of wound that Mr Dempsey suffered was fired from a range of about nine or 10 metres from memory, which was more than twice the distance that Richard Leonard was telling us he'd fired the arrow at. It suggested that what he was telling us wasn't, wasn't right. It didn't make sense given the bow that he had. And we were always of the belief that it resembled the stalking and hunting of a human being rather than a game animal. Uh, I mean, he used to go down there to, to hunt with his bow and shoot fish, and it sort of was a, a progression, if you like, from just hunting mere fish to stalking a human game and actually shooting him from a distance. Now, these tests, they, they were certainly not to the point scientifically that would be accepted as being irrefutable in court as evidence, but it was something that we had to do for ourselves. The pig test wasn't allowed in court. 
but the jury did get to hear a taped conversation that showed Leonard wasn't threatened by Dempsey's homosexuality, as he had claimed. In his interview, he was building a defence of provocation, which suggests that he'd been outraged by a homosexual advance made to him. But we'd had a recorded telephone call from Mr Leonard where he was uh, attempting to get a job in a male brothel. Yes, hello, my name is Richard. I'm just wondering if you have any positions vacant at the moment. Um, yeah, we're always looking for people. Do you realise that male to male, most of our work? I do realise, yes. What do you look like? OK, I'm around about 5'10". Athletic build. Are you smooth or hairy? Smooth. Smooth, right. Um, and how old are you? 22. 22. When can you come in for an interview? So we knew that the perceived outrage or the fainted outrage didn't really have very much substance. Again, that put another hole in, his, um, in the story he was giving us. Another tape presented to court was even more damning. Some months after we charged Mr Leonard, police conducting another inquiry were able to provide us with a tape from the jail in which Mr Leonard just callously was bragging about the circumstances of killing Stephen Dempsey. account given in that tape certainly indicated a state of mind that was far more calculating, far more callous than the shocked, affronted, almost apologetic account that he gave in his record of interview at Manly. When I realised that the guy, this guy's dead and so I slashed it out and I, I grabbed the guy's legs and I pulled him over to, to a deep creek. And then he, he sank down into the water. And then, and then I picked up my bow and, and like ran a few steps to get that momentum and then I threw it into the water. And then of all things, he went to his mother's birthday party. After the party, he came back to Deep Creek with his trident boning knife. And in the middle of the night, he sat in Deep Creek and dismembered Mr. Dempsey's remains. I took out the knife and it was very bright. I think I remember the moon, it wasn't full, it was, it was pretty close to it. It was, it was a bright night. And I took the knife and and I cut, cut into the leg, and I cut around the leg, and then I cut up into into the joint. I used to work in an abattoir. Yeah. So I I, I don't think unless I unless I'd worked in this in the, in this place, and um, I don't think I would have been able to see what I did. He then put the limbs and the head in one bag and the torso in the other and then did two separate trips on his motorcycle and took them back to where he was living. And he put the remains in his refrigerator where they were to stay for the next three and a half months. Uh, I just took everything out of the fridge and put, put everything in there, including, including his clothes. On August the 2nd, 1994, Richard Leonard shot Stephen Dempsey with a bow and arrow. He then dismembered the body and put the remains in his fridge. Two weeks later, the killer began a relationship with 18-year-old Denise Shipley. I said, there is a person in, in the fridge. <coughs> and... Uh, and she was quite, uh, quite shocked. 
The two had known each other some years before when they attended the same church group. Four years later, they discovered a mutual love of drugs and violence. And on the 17th of November 1994, that combination proved lethal. The two went into the city, allegedly then under the influences of uh, LSD. They've wandered around the city. Um, we, we eventually like, found ourselves in, in Hyde Park and then we, we decided we'd go home again. I only had enough money to catch a bus bag, but Denise really wanted to, to get the taxi, so I said, I said, OK, well, we'll get the taxi, but you realise it means we, we're going to have to get out and run away. So he got into this cab and the driver was, uh, what, what's his name? The driver's name was Mr. Ezzedine Barmed. Ezzedine Barmed. Yes. So the driver was Ezzedine Barmed. He said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, we want to go to Colorado Plata. He's then told us that um, he's didn't have the money to pay the fare, so he's pulled a knife out and put it to Mr. Barmet's throat. Uh, the way he describes it has just been, well, he didn't know what else to do. I pulled out my knife from the inside pocket of my, my Nike jacket and put the point of the knife to the driver's neck. And said, don't move. Uh, at the time I said, don't move, he grabbed the knife out of my hand and and then everything got completely insane. Mr. Barmet's grabbed the knife from him, they've struggled, and he's been able to put one, stab him once to the chest. And I got stabbed in the chest through my jacket. Um, by Mr. Barmet. By Mr. Barmet. Richard Leonard, who was a fairly strong bloke, has been able to grab the knife and uh, has just, in a frenzy, attacked Mr. Barmet. And I was wildly stabbing as I was trying to get uh, into the front on top of him and was stabbing everywhere. What hand did you have knife? Would have been my right hand and, and uh, the, my, my knife was very sharp. Uh, so I had, a, I had a steel that I used and I always had my knife sharp. It was, was, was my favourite knife. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually cost me $90 that knife. And uh, if you could get a tomato and slice it like, like a razor blade, it was, mm. it was really good. At some stage during the struggle, Leonard left his calling card on the steering wheel. His fingerprints were confirmed as being the ones investigators found on the ignition key. After receiving treatment at St Vincent's Hospital, Leonard and Shipley have returned home and realised that there could be some activity relative to the police and they've then decided to discard Mr Dempsey's remains. They've driven to Church Point where we found the receipt where they hired the boat from the boat shed, little runabout, little tinny. You're saying Denise has come down here in the boat? Yes. She crashed in the sandbag somewhere around here, indicated. What did you do then? I, I got her to go for a walk and I carried carried two, two parcels in sheets down and, and put them in into the boat with with, uh, with wire and wire and wire ties and a, uh, and a pair of pliers. And what were those two parcels you're referring to? They were the remains of Mr. Dempsey. Leonard's pulled some rocks from the shore put those in the boat, and as he's made his way into pit water, he's um, wired the rocks to the torso. There's only one thing I know absolutely, I can absolutely say is, uh, as a fact, and that was that there was no residential dwellings in, in the place where I stopped and, and I drifted. So, to my mind, logic, I would say that, that I stopped here. He's thrown the remains over the side of the boat and then returned back, returned the boat, cleaned the boat out, and uh, they've gone home. Three weeks later, the torso surfaced, and Leonard's perfect crime came undone. Without that arrowhead, 
there's a very good possibility without an admission of guilt from somebody that we never ever would have solved it because it was the one piece of evidence that led us to the offender. Richard Leonard's trial for the murder of Stephen Dempsey lasted 12 days. The court was told how, as a child, Leonard had spent his school holidays with his grandmother, chopping off the ears and tails of little kittens. And when he ran out of kittens to mutilate, his grandmother would just buy him more. It's always nail-biting, waiting for a jury to return. In this case, the jury was out for four days. The team were on edge, but more than anything, I think we, um, we really felt for the family of the two victims on this occasion. It was very, very tough for them. The judge described Richard William Leonard as the epitome of evil. Richard Leonard is only 24 years old, but a judge has decided he must spend the rest of his life in prison for killing New Zealander Stephen Dempsey and taxi driver Es Dean Barmard. Now, we're very You're happy. very happy. Yeah, thank you. Family friends of the taxi driver stabbed 37 times by Leonard three years ago, so the life imprisonment is deserved. I love to see him, you know, I'm in Safar, you know, like, like us, like the children he left behind. In sentencing Leonard, Justice Badgery Parker said imposing life imprisonment was a very serious step, but the fact that Richard Leonard had killed two people and been diagnosed as a psychopath meant he'd always be a risk to the community. His girlfriend, Denise Shipley, was sentenced to a minimum of three years and a maximum of eight for her involvement as an accessory after the fact to both murders. The result when it came through, well, they were, they were related. It was a, it was a huge re release of a burden for them and certainly the never-to-be-released sentence. That was everything they could have hoped for. We were never going to bring their son or father back. But as the team, we were able to give them everything we certainly could in terms of the way we went around our job. And that was good.